Hey, welcome to Vibe Church. You have found us in our series called Mate. This series comes from John 1. It's a thrilling series, an exciting series, and I know that God is going to bless you as a result. So enjoy. Man, hey, you ready for the Word of God today? Uh, I'm hoping to teach you some things this morning in our time together. And uh, we're in a series called Made, week three. Would you open up to our series scripture? John chapter one, verse one. It reads, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Over the series, we have been looking into what God has made and the creative ways in which He makes. Week one, we looked at innovation from London. We talked about the unique style to the way God makes, that He makes something from seemingly nothing. Last week, we looked at fashion and how God fits us into His body. Today, we're gonna focus on worship. And I wanna kind of bring some things into your attention that I feel like every believer needs to know. And and I'm gonna kind of frame that with the sermon, made in part, made in part. And I know God's gonna speak to us today. I feel it in my bones. I feel like God's got something ripe and ready that you're gonna be able to put your hands and sink your teeth into this week and outwork it in your life. So as you ready your hearts for God's Word, would you you just go ahead and find maybe two or three of your favorite people? Because obviously they're sitting next next to you. Husbands, choose your wives. Okay, find your favorite person. Give them a high five real quick, then take your seat. Go for it, go for it. Oh, I don't know what you were doing there. Happy Sunday. So glad you found yourself in church. You're not at work. Quick question, how many people in your work life, you, you work like in a team? You work in a group. Like you've got like a team that you collaborate with and you work with. Quick hands up, be proud of it. I right, call cool. how many people are like on your own. You're in your own little world. You have no one around you. You're just responsible for yourself. You're not dependent on anybody else. You make your own moves. Quick, you know, be, be proud about it. All my entrepreneurs, look at you guys. All right. Again, all the team players, all the people on a team, in a team, leading a team, look at this, the majority of us. You know what I found? Let me help you out today. I found that the success of working with a team is in the team selection. How many people would give me an amen? It's all about the team selection. And this wasn't something I learned from the Silicon Valley. This is something I learned back in school because we used to do group work at school. And uh, I found very early on that it's all about the team selection that I knew when the teacher was about to allocate group work, I would position myself next to, next to the smartest people in the class, and I would make sure I assembled a Marvel team. That's what I would do. I would, I would literally assemble a team of expert students that would carry me all the way through to success. And you might think, hey, come on, you, you, that means you weren't the smartest person in the group. No, I was the smartest person by getting the smarter people on my team. Many of you hate me because I was that guy. You carried me. You're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, uh, and, and, and honestly, that's the way I did school. I would, I would, I would take school uh, every day at a time. No preparation. <laughs> Turn up. I'm like, what are we doing today, team? And uh, they would be like, what are you contributing? I'm like, come on. Everyone needs a leader, <laughs> right? <laughs> every team needs a foreman. Directing and allocating and encouraging. I was great with the encouragement. Sometimes I'd say, hey, we can do better, team. Let's, <laughs> let's step it up a little bit. And uh, especially when, we, when it came to music class, because anybody do music class? Anybody do, like do music class? We had to, in our music class, we had to do uh, periodic performances. And so we would be allocated and we'd actually, all the way through the year, we'd have our group that we would do performances with. I stacked it. You better believe it, I stacked it. These guys that were on my team, they were pretty much semi-professional musicians. And so we could play any song and they would just give me a part and I'd, I'd do it. Sometimes, I, I, sometimes they wouldn't even plug me in. I'd just, I'd just be like the face of the thing, you know what I mean? And, and, and I had actions and I had moves and, and, and sometimes they'd make me sing something. Sometimes they would turn the microphone off, but it didn't matter, we were having fun and I would sail through. And I wouldn't even know. Sometimes we'd turn up and they're like, hey, it's performance day. I'm like, oh, is it? Okay, what are we singing? 
and they'd already prepared everything. It was great. One time we turned up, it was performance day, and I said, so, so what are we doing? And they're like, oh, you didn't hear, it's solo performance day. <laughs> I, I was not prepared. And, and I'm like, oh, great. And you know what's funny? It's like when there's no pressure, you could think of 100 songs to do, sing, play, but, but in that moment, I couldn't think of anything. I forgot everything that I'd ever learned or known. And, and as I'm sitting there thinking, what am I gonna do? My name's about to be called. I know I'll go with Oasis Wonderwall because, because it's like just three chords. You know what I mean? I can, I can nail that one. And then the guy before me did that song. <laughs> I remember getting called up and I was on my way up, literally blank, blank. I stood there in front of the microphone and I'm happy to report to you for the first time ever, I performed an original. <laughs> Made it up. Failed the class. <laughs> I'm better in a group. I'm better in a partnership. I want you to keep that in mind because maybe it's interesting to you to know that each gospel writer in their introduction of Jesus find Jesus at a different part in his life. For instance, you've got Matthew. Matthew starts with the genealogy of Jesus. He's going to take kind of like a, a bit of a generational understanding of Jesus and see how starting with Abraham, each and every generation that led up to the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus and how each generation worked into the plan of God. What you're going to find with Mark is Mark, he gets to the ministry moment. He gets right to the action, talking about there was a voice, John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness. Then we see the baptism of Jesus and his ministry begin. Then what you're going to find as you go to Luke, Luke winds it back just a little bit and he says, hey, we need to know who this John the Baptist is in relation to Jesus. He gives us the background story of Elizabeth and the connections and, and he's a little bit more detailed. But what we get with John as a gospel writer is he goes all the way back to the beginning. He wants you to know that make sure right from the start of his gospel is that, that Jesus was there at the beginning. Jesus wasn't just there at the New Testament. Jesus was there before any testament got written because He was the Word of God. He was with God. He was, he was God and He was with God in the beginning. This is so significant and important for, for John to establish for what he wants to reveal to us, that he wants you to know that the way God made the world is that He made it, not just that He made it, but there was a way to the way He made it, that He made it on purpose. That everything God made was made on purpose. That God didn't make anything by accident or reaction. Like sometimes you can fall into the trap to think that God wasn't prepared for the fall in the garden. And so he's like, well, let's remake something. Or like, like the way you create. Because you're lineal in time. So the way you make is you get a blank canvas, you start somewhere and then it evolves as you go and you build upon what you've built. And now, now, now we built upon crypto, we've got AI, we've got all these different iterations and we weren't prepared for it, but we're going, we're going with the flow. We're making it up as we go. Everyone is just making it up. Jesus, however, was prepared. He has been prepared and pre-planned from the beginning. Jesus is not lineal. Jesus outside of time sees the beginning from the end and prepares for you and makes a way for you so that no matter what you face, God's prepared. That is very comforting to the life of the believer to know that God is not reacting, that God is not nervous, that God is not pacing the hallways of heaven wondering what he's gonna do in your life now that you made that decision he wasn't prepared for. Like, like Jesus, like, man, I'm out of ideas. <laughs> Gabriel, Michael, any, any, no, no, he's not making it up. He's seated. He is seated on the throne. He has a plan. Even though you're nervous and you think, God, where are you going to come from? God's like, I know exactly where the resources are coming from. I know exactly where my provision's coming from. I've already moved several pieces away. There's a fish swimming with a coin in its mouth. All you have to do is reach down and pick it. Got a plan. I saw this moment. Pre, pre plan. That's the way God makes. He makes to a, to a plan. Nothing with God is random. Uh, nothing's an afterthought. Nothing is never not prepared because God, with God, everything has a purpose. For, for instance, one of our favorite verses here at Vive Church is Romans 8, 28. You know it. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His 
Likewise, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill His good God has a purpose. He does things on purpose. He writes within a plan. And what John is ultimately emphasizing and reiterating here is, with, is that God is intentional with His design. Now, it's not just John who does this, but the Apostle Paul he also kind of takes a similar approach in his epistle to the Ephesians where he gives us a brief, but I would say comprehensive description of God's plan. You see, in Ephesians chapter two, we have one of the most, I would say, potent passages on the plan of God regarding his purpose for us as humans. We're gonna put this up on the screen, Ephesians chapter two, but I would highly encourage you to, to flick to it in your Bible because you're gonna need this during your week, all right? You're gonna, you're gonna, this is like, this is meaty stuff, all right? This ain't just encouraging. This is like meaty stuff where you're gonna have to kind of like sink your teeth into it, like a good steak that you're gonna have for lunch today in Jesus' name. And uh, in Ephesians chapter two, verse four, it says, but God being rich, (laughs) I like that, rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Keep going. Even when you were dead in in our trespasses because we couldn't do anything, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And raise uh, raise us up with him and seat us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Next one. Keep going, keep going. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Hold it there. Please do not turn off media team that screen. I need you to keep it up there. I need you to kind of marinate in this. I need you to simmer in this and understand what it is that Paul is saying. He's highlighting here that the very plan and the purpose of God is written in this sentence. That from the beginning of time, the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. God's plan from that moment at the commencement of time, the creation of the world, this was the plan in mind. That, that in the coming ages, in these ages, as time would go on each and every generation that you're a part of right now, the generations before and the generations that will come after us, by the way, you're not the only generation. But in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For those that are in Christ Jesus, we would be the display of His immeasurably rich grace and mercy that when people look at us, they would be astounded at the goodness of our God. When people look at the saints, they would be mind blown at the goodness of God. That they would see a generation that don't deserve it, but because God's so rich in His mercy would bestow it upon us. That we would be the icons and the models and the signifiers and the window into His wonderful grace. Grace, it's incredible. Now, this is important to know and I wanna make sure I camp here long enough so that the whole congregation are clapping and applauding because the back row is still figuring it out. But I, wanna, I don't wanna leave anybody behind today because I feel like God's gonna unveil some things that are gonna help you in your walk. And what Paul is ultimately revealing that even though we were, let's put it biblically, ensnared in our own sin, because there was a fall in the garden, you know that, that, from the fall in the garden, we were plunged into sin and therefore everybody born since then has been born into a sin nature. And however, God had a plan from the beginning, a plan called redemption. It was a plan that involved Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Word of God as Savior. And through, though, sorry, Jesus and through our adoption into the family of God, we have been brought into what's called a lifelong process of transformation. Track with me. We, we, we are now in a, It's a lifelong and dare I say daily journey of being transformed into the likeness of God, being fit into the the nature where we can exist within His presence. So we are being molded and shaped and transformed or being conformed to His image that happens daily. This is why uh, it, when you're new to faith, it's a little confusing because you're wondering, hang on, I thought coming to faith means I, I face no more problems. Mm-mm, sorry, sorry to tell you this, honey. It actually means you face more problems because the things that you did before that you didn't feel guilty about, now you feel guilty about it. So it's even worse. But the fact that you feel guilty means you're getting better. That I'm growing. That I'm not staying stuck in my sin. 
the Holy Spirit is convicting me of my sins so that I can actually change some actions and come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and begin to glorify Him. I'm being shaped into the likeness of Christ daily, daily, daily. And guess what? You don't arrive. That may be encouraging. That may be disheartening. For those who thought they were close, you ain't. Each and every day, you are being transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ. That's why you feel like I keep circling the same things. And maybe you are circling the same things. Maybe you are circling anger yet again. Maybe you thought you, you had it because you did that 12-day fast and you thought, like, that's out of my life. And then all of a sudden you went back to work and now you realize that you don't like working with people in the office and you don't like working on a team, but you have to work on a team and you don't like your boss and you get angry. Okay, guess what? Maybe that's true, but hopefully you, your reaction is different. Or maybe you're not just assessing why they make you angry. Maybe you're assessing why am I angry? Maybe you're realizing that nobody can rob me of my joy, so why would I give them my joy? <laughs> so so, so maybe, maybe God has got you on a journey of transformation where I'm being made into the likeness and image of Christ. And, and you see, of course, it's gradual. <laughs> We're meant to, over our life, display a greater measure of his grace and glory. And if we jump down to verse 10, we're gonna see that Paul summarizes God's plan with this one. It's pretty well known. In Ephesians 2, 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If you are not convinced that God is a pre-planned God, please read more scripture. You see, when God makes, He makes with a plan in mind. He makes with a, a plan in mind. That can be comforting to know that what you're going through, God's not surprised. To the situation that's scaring you, God ain't afraid. The situation that you think is the end of you, God's like, no, it's just the beginning of something new. God is not, I don't know who needs to hear that today, but God is not surprised. God is prepared and pre-planned for everything that you will face in life. So much so that he will even use it as an opportunity to achieve his will in molding you and shaping you into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, while that is comforting to know that God is pre-planned, what can be confusing is the understanding that God only makes in part. God only makes in part. It's almost like he purposely makes in part. Has, has anybody ever bought anything from Ikea? Mm. You know, you think you're buying a bed, but you're actually buying a box with parts. That's what you're buying. You're like, yeah, I'll take that and it comes out in a box with parts. In fact, when we first moved here 11 years ago, we, we had, a, I would call it a meager church planning budget, the smallest known to any church planner ever because we came from Australia and we had to literally sell what we had and uh, we had some friends and family just give us a donation is what I call it, some, don like, some goodwill, hey, first meal on us kind of thing. And, um, and then I was able to kind of go uh, preaching for a couple of months beforehand. I had churches invite me, say, come preach. We'll, we'll kind of sow into your church plant. But by the time I paid for my, my, my transportation and my accommodation, what they end up giving me was just enough to bless them back. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll get lunch. Uh, and uh, that's how it works. So when we arrived here, we had to use the budget both to set up the church and to set up our home. So Ikea it was. <laughs> And, and, and we went to Ikea and we loaded up with flat packs and boxes. Vance and Kim were our first two members in Vive Church. And I remember they sat down and they're like, we're in. And that, that requires like faith back then. Now for all of you who are new, you're like, oh yeah, I'm coming to this church. It's amazing. The worship's great. The preaching's phenomenal. Uh, I'm going to come to this church. And so I get it. It doesn't take much faith to go, this is the place for me. But back then, you didn't need bold faith. You needed just blind faith, but blind faith. That's what you needed. Just, it's just blind faith. Whatever's in, I'm in. That's what they had. I remember our first conversation after, I, after we were sharing the vision. They're like, we're in. What do we do? I said, tithe. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? And then I said, cool, done. What next? I said, Here's a screwdriver. We're going to Ikea. That's literally what it was. And we spent the first week just putting 
things. You know what's the most confusing thing when you do these flat packs is when there's a, a significant part left over. <laughs> you know, it's like, like if it's a screw, you're like, oh, maybe they gave me extra. <laughs> but when it's a support beam, you're like, hang on, I, I don't know about this. I don't know, I'm going to collapse in the middle of the night or something like that. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that that video that Pastor Carly was speaking on before, she said something, she said a line. And she said this line, it's amazing when the pieces come together. When all the, the pieces come together. That's, that's the process of songwriting. And, and I always think it's hilarious because when we go through the songwriting process, it's always chaotic. It's always just, but I love that about worship, that worship is pieces coming together and it comes together at the right time. It's always relieving to me when we're in the chaos of the writing and then we get out to church and then you sing it and you're like this. <laughs> and I love that because I, you're in such peace. That came from the chaos. Wow. That, that in the midst of that chaos, you're finding peace in his presence and it's amazing that as we were reviewing the video this week literally I saw that line and God spoke to me Andrew was trying to talk to me and I didn't hear what he was saying but but God spoke to me and God said my peace comes in pieces and I quickly thumbed it into my phone because I wanted to remember it and I said now proceed Andrew but but I'm, I, God spoke to me clearly peace my peace comes in pieces God works in pieces Part. I'll show you with scripture in John because John also includes for us in his gospel, he actually gives us some, some uh, private conversations that Jesus has with the disciples. John, John brings us into those moments. And what we get in John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says to the disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He says, peace I give to you, my peace. My peace I give to you, not as the world does, because the way the world gives peace or the way the world does peace is through escape. For the world, peace is a place, vacation. Peace is a destination that I need to escape my setting, my chaos, and I need to switch off, tune out, dial out. That's where I can finally get some peace. But that's not the way peace is with Jesus. Jesus says, I'm not gonna take you out. I'm gonna put my peace in. I'm going to bring my peace into the midst of your chaos. I'm going to bring my peace. That's why it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. The way Jesus worked with his peace is he says, let me give you a piece of me. I'm going to be in you. I'm going to be present with you. That's why I make a table for you in the presence of your enemies. I don't take you out of the fight. I bring my peace into the battle so that while the war is waging around you, you seem to be able to keep peace, speak peace, minister peace in the midst of the chaos. Even better, I get to use your situation to speak peace to others. That's the way peace works. It comes in, in pieces. This is what confused the disciples when they, it kind of freaked them out when Jesus said, I gotta leave. They're like, yeah, what? No, I gotta leave. I gotta go and be with the Father. But it wasn't that he was leaving them alone. He was leaving them with his spirit. He, he was leaving them with the very spirit of God which means that we were now commissioned and supercharged with the Holy Spirit to go out and extend the rule and reign of Christ Jesus on the earth. Now, this is one of the things I absolutely love most about worship is that it requires many parts coming together. In fact, for those that aren't musical here, what actually makes a harmony is many parts sung together. Did you know that in music, it's the combination of simultaneously sounding notes that, that actually produce a chord? Okay, you already knew that, all right. Uh, maybe you did, but did you know that the four Gospels actually are called a harmony as well because that they each present a, a simultaneous or parallel narrative that works together to present a single story of Christ. Actually, John doubles down on this by recording another conversation Jesus had with the disciples in the very next chapter. And in this one, Jesus is talking about the vine. He's talking about himself as the vine. He says this in uh, John chapter 15, verse five. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for, check this out, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What, 
what John is trying to emphasize is what Jesus was revealing to the disciples. There's a lot you can do apart from me, but nothing will last. Nothing lasting. It will shrivel. It's not connected. You need to stay connected to the source for what you do to produce lasting fruit. You can have a flash in the pan season of, of athletics. You can have a, a really good career. You can have, even, even have a really good exit. But, but if you want something to last, it's got to remain connected to the vine. If you want it to have impact and you want it to have reach and you want it to have influence, it's got to be connected to the vine. And so we make sure we know that God in making things, He makes in part for the purpose of partnership. That the reason God only makes in part is so that he could bring us into partnership. Now, I don't want you to be confused because when I say that God makes in part, I'm not suggesting that he doesn't complete his part. Because we know very well that as Jesus hung on the cross, as he was uttering his last breath, he said, it is finished. That means my part is done. Salvation has been won. My grace is now available. Now here's your part. Here's your part. He's your part. So what's our part? <laughs> well, it's important to know that because Jesus has done his part, he's now set us up to do our part. And this is essentially what Paul wants us to know and what he writes to the Ephesians. In fact, he, he opens up his letter to the Ephesians with this in mind that he wants them to know that for them to do their part, they're actually fully equipped with everything they need to do their part, okay? So, so he actually starts in the first chapter of Ephesians, verse three, by letting, him, letting us know and letting the Ephesians know, you have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. There ain't nothing you need apart from what you've got available to you, okay? So that's the paradigm he wants. It's not like you're in a deficit, you're not limited. For you to fulfill your part, you've already got everything you need. Then he goes on to say this in verse 11, in him, We've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. Listen to the language I'm, I'm using. I gotta move because there's something I wanna do, but, but I need you to listen to the language. He's saying, for those of us that hope in Christ, that we would operate in such a way to the glory of God. To the glory. Verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, mean you received salvation and believed in him and were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Again, what Paul is doing here is he's doing something extremely significant. He's unpacking the fact that when we believe in Christ as our Savior, we received our inheritance. We were saved. We were receiving what Jesus had done, His part. He is finished. His part done. When we receive it, we receive His part. Now we're set up to do our part. So what's our part? Well, it's pretty simple. Are you ready? You might need to write this down. Our part in the plan of God is to reveal His glory as one under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. Our part in the plan of God is to reveal His glory as one under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I need to delineate the significance of this because you give me that blank look like, Pastor, could you speak American? All right. Part one, God's grace. And every believer gets here. Everybody who's ever put their faith in Jesus is at this part where they receive what God's done. They receive what Jesus did, His sacrifice for our sins and brought us into the family of faith. We have received the grace of God. But too many believers camp here at grace. Stay right here at grace. How do I know this? Because nothing really changes about your life. I still wanna live like I used to live. I'm, 
I'm still gonna sleep with my girlfriend. I'm, I'm still gonna, you know, cheat on my taxes because I'm under the grace of God. I'm still gonna kind of, you know, cut people off and cuss people out. I don't need to change my language. I'm under the grace of God. Now, thankful for you, and I'm grateful for you too, that God's grace is massive. That God's grace is unending. That God's grace and His great love toward us, He keeps loving us unconditionally. So it's not based on what I do. His grace is still for me. But that's still immature. To say I'm gonna stay at grace because that's His part, you're receiving His part. But for you to now do your part means I now need to not just make Him Saviour, I need to make Him Lord. That's why He's Lord and Saviour. It's as I come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, I'm going on the journey of being transformed into the image of Christ. I'm not just camping at grace as my excuse to behave like the world. I, I know I need to come under the Lordship because the purpose of Christ in our life is that our lives would reflect the glory of God, that the world would look at us as one under the Lordship of Christ and say, that is a good God. I know what they were like. God graced them and built them and now look at the way they gear their life. How are you meant to display how, let me ask the question, how are you meant to display God? What's different about your life than the world that displays God? It's your customs, it's your behaviours, it's, it's your language, it's your actions. All these things matter. Because as I come under the Lordship of, of Christ, it doesn't just mean one area. <laughs> as I come under the Lordship of Christ, I, I bring every area. I like this way, if He's not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. Because <laughs> when I make Him Lord, that changes the way I talk. It changes the priority of my calendar. That's why the believers gather every single Sunday. Just the fact that you come to church every single Sunday is speaking to the world that are lost and broken. It's crazy to them. You're crazy to them. You're not crazy to me. You, you know what I mean? But to them, you're flat out wild on football Sunday. Why would you be in the house of God? Why wouldn't you be cheering your team on? Oh, you're under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? See, when you're under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, what I prioritize changes. When I'm under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, where I put my finances changes. When I'm under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the way I build my business changes. The orientation of my parenting changes. The way I husband changes. The way I live my life and friendships changes because I'm under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. To be under the Lordship of Jesus Christ does not mean that Jesus is an addition to my life. It means He is everything in my life. The orientation of my life changes. To be under the Lordship. He's now my ruler, my boss, the master of all. And Paul presents it like this to the Philippians. He says, make no mistake in Philippians 2 verse 9. He says, God, talking about Jesus, has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name. So that at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father that at that name every knee in eternity those that have been those that are coming those that are now will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory to the glory so coming under Lordship is to the glory of His name the way you glorify God is by coming under Lordship it's your part I'm not just sitting here taking His part but I'm in partnership. So there's my part, which is now to align my life under Lordship. This is such good preaching. This is so helpful. This is like the most practical thing I could give you. This is central to the Bible. The central message of the Bible is Jesus Christ is Lord. That's, that's what the whole Bible's about. That's what the story is about from beginning to end, even in the middle parts, is that Jesus Christ is Lord. The quicker we realise that, the revelation is the first part, the application is the powerful part. That I might get the revelation from reading Scripture that Jesus Christ is Lord, but unless I change my life and uh, rearrange my actions and I apply it to my life, I don't get to give anyone glory. Who gets glory when 
The saving work of Christ is in your life, but your life looks no different. You know, people, people say to me, man, Pastor Adam, it's so vibe. You guys are so passionate in worship. People, people stand, like, people stand up during the message. I've had, we had, um, I don't know if we still do it, but we used to have like, um, what's that critics, you know, when people review things? Yo, um, I think we used to have one for the church. It was hilarious that people would write, respond, oh man, they're so responsive in church. Like as if that's weird. I see most people will be yelling their heads off this afternoon during the football game. And they have done one single part for you. Everything they're doing is for themselves. They ain't a team, they're individual contributors on a team. You're not part of that team. You can wear the colours, you can wear the jersey, and if you are, good for you, but guess what? They don't know your name. Christ has done His part for you, so that now you can do your part for Him, that you can come under His Lordship and begin to live a different way because He has freed you from your sin. He freed you from your shame. He's freed you so that you can live differently and come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's where worship becomes powerful because worship is our way to glorify Him. Do you know what? There are too many worship songs being written so that you would feel something. So that we would, we love the feelings. We love the feels. So I can, oh, I felt the presence today. Worship's not about you, by the way. It's better if you don't feel anything. It's better if you give something. Because worship is about saying, God, I'm going to give you by faith, not by feelings. I'm going to give you praise that is due to you because you are Lord of my life. Whether I feel like it or not, whether I have a hard week or a good week, whether I feel like celebrating or I feel like crying, I'm going to give God worship regardless. Whether I've got a good diagnosis or a bad diagnosis, whether I got a good report or a bad report, my first response is going to be worship to God because it's not based on how I feel. It's by faith and you are Lord of my life. So whatever the situation I'm facing, I'm going to give worship. I'm going to give praise. I'm going to give glory to the Lord of my life.